Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for July 2022. I'm Hayley and this month we're going to talk about another supermoon, how to find rays on the moon, opportunities to spot the planets, the Delta Aquarius meteor shower and our constellation of the month which is Lyra. Let's begin by taking a look at the planets. The planets are still putting on a good show this month in the early hours of the morning. The best time to go out and look for them is after midnight. You can see here that I'm looking towards the south southeast just after midnight on the 1st. All of the planets that we're going to talk about, with the exception of Mercury, get better in terms of visibility as the month goes on. But Mercury is best to view right at the beginning of the month. Um, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. If we take time onwards a little bit, I'm just going to go forward by an hour to 1am, you can see that Saturn's got a bit higher, Jupiter has now risen as well. If I go forward by another hour to 2am, we've now got Saturn, Jupiter and Mars. And then if I keep going, just after 3am, we've got Venus rising as well. Now, You've got Saturn, Jupiter, Mars and Venus. The sky is starting to brighten, so as you go towards sunrise, it will start to get more difficult to observe. I do want to keep going for a little bit longer, just to show you that Mercury rises just before four o'clock. There's also a pass of the International Space Station at about ten to four um, on the first of the month as well so if you're out looking for the planets and you're looking for mercury um on the morning of the first of july then you may see the iss come over um at around 10 to 4. so looking for mercury you as always when you're trying to spot mercury you'll need a nice clear horizon nothing obstructing your view no trees or buildings if you can manage it um, and you're looking to spot it just before the sun rises as we approach the middle of the month mercury reaches superior conjunction which means that it will be obscured by the sun and you won't be able to see it so if you want to spot mercury in the morning sky the best time to do it is the beginning of the month then after the middle of the month it will emerge again into the evening sky and we'll start to be able to look out for it in the evening towards the end of the month let's go take a look at the moon now so I'm going to take us to the 13th of July and we'll revisit the planets as we talk about how the moon tracks across the sky throughout the month. So I'll take us to the 13th and we're going to go into the evening sky. So we're just before 11 o'clock now. So on the 13th we have the full moon and it's another super moon. So we had a super moon last month where the full moon occurs at a time when the moon is closer to the earth in its orbit and we call it a super moon. Um, so this is the second one in a row. You can also look out for the moon illusion where the moon appears even larger because it is full and close to the horizon as it is in this view now. So we're looking um, towards the southeast just before 11 o'clock on the 13th. If we zoom in and take a look at the full moon, when we talk about observing the moon generally the best time to look out for the different features on the moon is not when it's full, it's when um, you can look along the terminator and you can see the interplay between light and shadow that happens um, as the moon goes through its different phases throughout the month. There is one particular type of feature though that is actually best observed during a full moon and that is lunar ray systems so I thought I'd spend a little bit of time telling you about how to spot lunar rays if you're out observing the super moon super full moon um, during the month of July so lunar rays are stripes of ejected material that are thrown out when or that were thrown out when um, craters were created on the moon through impacts. The most famous of which is the Tycho crater. Um, and you can see these, they look like bright stripes of ejected material that go a long way across the lunar surface. So when that impact happened, the material was thrown out across the moon and we can see the traces of it today. They're usually associated with younger craters. Um, so ty for Tycho, the example of Tycho um, that we were just talking about, that is 
thought to have formed around 100 million years ago, um, which actually makes it quite young. And it means that those stripes, those rays of material are fresher than um, material that's experienced more weathering. And that's why they appear brighter. Um, other examples of really good ray craters are the Copernicus and Kepler craters over here. And you can take a look for the ray systems that are um, going out from those craters as well. You can have a go with your naked eye. You, can, you might be able to spot some of these rays even with the naked eye. If you have a pair of binoculars, then binoculars are fantastic to explore um, ray systems on the moon. And if you have a, a telescope, then what you can do is start to look at some of the um, older, less bright craters and see if you can detect any hint of rays coming from those craters as well. If you'd like to record what you're seeing, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. You could try taking some photographs. So you can try um, taking photos with a camera or even with your smartphone. There are, um, if you have a small telescope, there are adapters that you can get now that you can use with a smartphone um, to uh, take images at the eyepiece. And that can work quite well on the moon. Another thing that you can do is you can sketch the moon and you can have a go at sketching these ray systems um, and that can be quite a nice low tech way to capture what you're seeing um, works quite well using pencil or charcoal um, and then you'll have a record of the rays that you've managed to see on the night that you go out. If we zoom out now and just take a look at how the moon tracks across the sky throughout the month. So um, one thing that I like to do is to see how close the moon gets to each of the planets through the month. And it's quite nice to observe them together, especially if you're a beginner observer and you um, might not be sure how to spot the planets. If you go out when the moon is nearby, then that can give you a really obvious um, point of reference to help you spot the planets. Um, so if we just go to the 15th and go into the early hours of the morning. Um, so actually, I'm not quite in the early hours yet. I'm just before midnight on the 15th. And you can see that the moon and Saturn appear quite close to each other. If we zoom in, um, you can see we have a gibbous phased moon. Um, and again, if it's not clear for the full moon on the 13th, uh, the gibbous phase is still a really good opportunity to observe those ray systems. So you've got the moon and Saturn together on the evening of the 15th, quite close together. If we keep going, I'm just going to take us a little bit later now. If we keep going... Um, to the 19th you can see that the moon makes its way across to Jupiter the reason it appears to do this is because the moon and the planets all appear along uh, the line known as the ecliptic so um, as the month goes on the moon appears to pass by all the planets um, so the moon and Jupiter and you can see as we've gone past full moon that phase is getting smaller we're getting more towards a half illuminated moon now and we've got Jupiter up here if we keep going, you can probably guess where we're going to go next. So over to the 22nd, 21st, 22nd, quite similar. I think it's a bit closer on the 22nd. And we have uh, the moon and Mars. We're also really close to Uranus here as well. But um, even if you have a telescope, Uranus is faint. And having the moon nearby, even though it's only a crescent, will hinder you trying to find it, though you can still have a go. So we've got a crescent moon now and we've got Mars. And I thought we'd just go in a bit closer and take a closer look at Mars. Um, so if you are looking at Mars with the naked eye, you might see that orangey colour If you or, or with a pair of binoculars. If you have a telescope of a reasonable size, um, so by reasonable size I mean four inches probably, um, objective lens the lens on the front of your telescope um four inches or bigger or 100 mil or bigger then you may be able to start to make out some of these features on the surface um so you've got the the lighter and darker areas you could have a go at sketching those out you've also got the southern uh, polar cap that you can have a go at see if you can spot or see so you'll see it as a white splodge um and the the polar caps of mars are really interesting because they contain glaciers made of both water ice and carbon dioxide ice and they undergo these huge seasonal changes where um when it's the winter the um carbon dioxide condenses and increases the size of those um 
polar caps condenses out of the atmosphere and then when the it warms up again then um that carbon dioxide sublimes back into the atmosphere and you get these sort of clouds appearing over the the poles um the southern polar cap of mars always stays pretty cold so there's always some carbon dioxide ice there throughout the year along with some water ice as well so just a little um, idea of what you might see if you can peek at Mars with a telescope. Also, you'll notice that Mars is showing a gibbous phase here as well. Um, you can't see the whole of the disk. If we continue with our lunar journey and go forward by a day, you can see that the moon is now approaching the constellation of Taurus and we're really close to um, the Pleiades star cluster or um, what's otherwise known as the Seven Sisters. My favourite binocular object. Um, if you've been watching these videos for a while, you've probably heard me say that lots of times. Um, so if you have a, a pair of binoculars, any pair of binoculars will do. Um, if you're looking to buy a pair of binoculars specifically for astronomy, then I really like 10 by 50 because they are um, not too heavy. So you can hold them pretty steady, but they allow for really great views of things just like this, the, the Pleiades star cluster. Um, so a, a nice crescent moon on the 23rd to point you um, to the Pleiades star cluster. And then if we go to, I'm just going to take us a little later so that we can see Venus. So if we go to the 26th, 27th, then the moon gets all the way down to where Venus is. Um, so, and we're looking at a really, really super thin crescent there. Let's go back a day to the 26th. So you see you've got a really, really thin crescent moon and you've got Venus. And if we take a look at Venus, um, and just like Mars, you can see that Venus is also showing a, a gibbous phase. So if you look at Venus through a telescope, you won't make out any surface detail because it's got that super thick atmosphere obscuring everything. But you will be able to make out the phase that the planet is showing, which at the end of July is a gibbous phase. If we leave the moon and the planets behind now and we'll take a look at our meteor shower for July, which is the southern delta aquarids um, and that meteor shower goes on throughout july but peaks towards the end of the month so if we go to the 28th and i'm just going to go back to the early hours of the morning and let's zoom out and put our meteor shower label on which is down here there we go um and the southern delta aquarids are in the constellation of Aquarius. So these meteor showers are always named for the constellation where the radiant appears. Um, so if you go out on the nights of um, the 28th, 29th, 30th, so um, late in the evening or into the early hours of the morning, have a look um, for the region of sky where you have the constellation of Aquarius and see if you can spot any meteors. As always with the meteor showers, you don't need to get hung up about trying to find exactly where the radiant is. Aquarius is a faint constellation. You can look anywhere in the sky and you will be able to see the meteors. The important thing is to try to find a dark location if you can. Let your eyes adapt to the dark. So don't look at any artificial sorts of sources of light for about 20 minutes. Get yourself comfortable, a deck chair or a sun lounger, something like that that you can lie on is always good and just lie back and see how many meteors you can spot. This isn't a meteor shower that has a huge um, hourly rate so you may not spot loads and loads of meteors but if you go out for long enough and it's clear then you should hopefully spot a few meteors and um, maybe even some really bright ones or some fireballs. Those um, things can always occur unexpectedly and um, make your observations even more exciting. Let's go to our constellation of the month now, which is Lyra. I'm just going to swing us around. You can see it up here. It's a fairly easy one to spot because it has the very bright star Vega 
as part of the constellation. Vega is the fifth brightest star in the night sky and it's the brightest star that you will see in this region of sky. So if you go out during the dark part of the night in July and look roughly southish, then um, look for the bright star, the brightest star that you can see and you're probably going to be looking at Vega. You can also use Saturn to help orient yourself. You can also use the Big Dipper to help orient yourself as well. And Cygnus is a very um, distinctive shape in this part of the sky as well, Cygnus the Swan. So you can use all of those things to help you to find the constellation of Lyra. And if we put the art on, you can see that Lyra is shown as a lyre, which is a harp-like instrument. And in Greek mythology, it was the instrument belonging to the musician Orpheus. And it said that the music that he was able to play with this lyre was so wonderful that it could charm even the trees, the mountains, the streams, the rocks. Um, there was nothing or um, nobody that couldn't be charmed by this music. There's one story that tells of how um, his wife, Eurydice, was killed and entered the underworld and um, Orpheus went after her to the underworld and he used his lyre to charm Hades, the, the god of the underworld or the god of the dead, um, into allowing him to bring Eurydice back with him. If we zoom out a little bit, and I'm going to take the art back off. You can also um, use Vega to help you to find the um, famous asterism of the Summer Triangle, which is Vega, Altair and Deneb. Um, so these three bright stars together form the Summer Triangle. So if you go out on a, a clear night and have a look in this part of the sky, then you should be able to see these three quite clearly um, and you will have spotted the Summer Triangle. Another thing that you can look out for in the constellation of Lyra is a famous star known as the Double Double. And you can see me pointing at it with my mouse here. So if you have good eyesight, you might be able to resolve that there are two stars here. Um, if you don't, you can have a look with a pair of binoculars. You should certainly be able to see that there's two stars here with a pair of binoculars. Um, so a double star. If you have a telescope and you look at these a little bit more closely, then you will see that each of these double, uh, each of these stars in the double star is also a double star. So it's actually two binary stars um, that are orbiting each other. Um, so a four star system known as the double double. So when you're out looking at Lyra, see if you can find the double double. That brings me to the end of our tour of the night sky for July 2022. I hope that you have clear skies and I will be back next month to talk about what you can see in August.